Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 21st of August. Hope everyone has had a great week so far. As always, I have the chapters at the bottom of the video, and so you can jump to any particular update that you care most about. New videos this week. I created a video all about the new Entra permissions management. So Entra is this new family of solutions related to identity, and for the permissions management, it's all about getting insight into, well, what permissions do identities have, be it users or applications across the different clouds? Could be Azure, could be AWS, uh, Google Cloud, helping me right-size them, and maybe even enabling things like permissions on demand. So I get the permissions as I need them. Now I did a really quick video on IOPS, throughput and latency, what they are, why we care when we talk about storage. I also did a little uh, state of the mind podcast if you're interested in that sort of thing. On to the new features, so from the compute side. So Azure Red Hat OpenShift is available in new regions. Remember, the whole point of the Azure Red Hat OpenShift is it's this highly available, fully managed OpenShift cluster on demand in Azure that's monitored and operated jointly between Microsoft and Red Hat. So now it's available in West Central US, Australia Central, and Sweden Central. Um, Azure Container Apps now have Dapper 1.8.3 support. So the whole point of Azure Container Apps is, hey, I wanna deploy my microservice, my containerized application, but maybe I don't wanna worry about Kubernetes. I don't even wanna worry about the Azure Kubernetes service that takes away a lot of the management of that. So with minimal setup, I can just deploy, it's still going to Kubernetes, it just abstracts away the AKS. But on top of that, it gives me components like KEDA, uh, the Kubernetes event-driven autoscaler, so I can autoscale my loads. It has things like Envoy for the great um, distribution of traffic, maybe I wanna do blue-green or other types of split portion traffic between the instances, has this sidecar to help me with the network communications between the pods, and it gives me Dapper. So Dapper is that distributed application runtime, and it gives me a whole set of services that help my microservice application function. I can think of state management, publish, subscribe, secret management, input, output, binding, a um, whole bunch of other things. So that's now just available, and it's going to this new 1.8.3 version. On the AKS side, we now have these automated deployments. Now, I could always do DevOps pipelines. I could always push to uh, Kubernetes to AKS. But now what we have in Azure Kubernetes Service in preview is this ability to have this automated deployment blade. And from that, I can say, hey, I wanna create a new automated deployment. I authorize to my GitHub repo. I tell it the Docker file, the Azure Container Registry, the image. Am I gonna use a Helm or Kubernetes manifest? A target namespace? and go, and it will then go and create those GitHub actions and the automation to now just deploy to my AKS every time I do a new commit to that repo. AKS blob CSI, so what I can now have is through that container storage interface, I can mount blob storage either via blob fuse or NFS 3.0, so it's available for my pods. Maybe it's, hey, I have a large amount of data. Maybe it's log files, maybe it's media. But it just gives me another option along with things like Azure files, uh, managed disk, Azure NetApp files as an option for that durable type storage for my Kubernetes based workloads. AKS KMS plugins, so obviously KMS is the key management service in Azure. Great for storing my secrets, my keys, my certificates. And what this plugin enables me to do is now for the secrets I might have in my etcd database that's part of that control plane of Kubernetes, it can now encrypt at risk using a key from my KMS. So I have control of that key, I can control things like the rotation. Now to use this, I must have a user assigned managed identity to my AKS. I can't use a system assigned because if you think about system assigned managed identities share a life cycle with the resource. Well, I need to give the AKS permission to the key vault as it's created. Well, since the system assigned managed identity wouldn't be there yet, 
I'd get into this cyclical dependency. So it has to be a user assigned managed identity that I give permission to the KMS. And then I'm going to let the AKS use that user assigned managed identity to access and act on that key. AKS also now has dedicated host support. Remember, usually when we create our node pools, those nodes are virtual machines from the whole set of shared infrastructure running on all those different physical hosts. With dedicated host, I as a tenant get the entire capacity of that host. So I buy a particular set of dedicated hosts of particular SKUs, and then based on the SKU of the dedicated host, I can fill it with different size VMs of the associated SKU. It could be compute centric or memory centric, could be general purpose, whatever that might be. Well, now I can actually specify the host group containing those dedicated hosts when I go and create a new node pool. So I can actually use those dedicated hosts for my AKS node pools. AKS Kubernetes 1.24 is now GA. It finally removed the Docker shim. Everything's container D uh, these days anyway, and there's lots of other changes. And Jetstream DR for the Azure VMware solution now has Azure NetApp file support. So obviously the Azure VMware solution are VMware clusters running in Microsoft data centers. It enables me as a customer, say, bring my existing VMware knowledge, my VMware workloads, vMotion them, came around using my vSphere tools, even though they're now hosted in Microsoft data centers. And what the Jetstream DR solution enables me to do is replicate from my on-premises VMware solution to historically, it was things like blob storage, and then I can restore them to the Azure VMware solution, but now it can also target Azure NetApp files um, for that uh, replication target. On the networking side, huge update. Private endpoints, remember private endpoints enable me to have an IP address in my subnet, in my virtual network that represents a specific instance of a service. Um, it could be a database, it could be app, some sort of app service, whatever that might be. But now rather than going via the public endpoint of that service, I talk to this IP address in my virtual network. But there were some restrictions on certain networking features. Network security groups and user-defined routes were two of those. Now they have gone GA. So there's a, an attribute I set, the private endpoint network policies property I have to enable on the subnet that contains the private endpoint. But now both of these features would then be lit up. So network security groups, hey, I can define those rules to control the flow of traffic to the private endpoint in that subnet. User-defined routes, now I don't have to create a slash 32 specific to the private endpoint. It can just be, hey, this range of IP addresses, um, the next hop actually goes via this thing, could be a network virtual appliance, but I can now have those apply even when it's a private endpoint is in that target address range. On the database side, so Azure Arc enabled SQL managed instance. So Azure Arc, remember, extends the Azure control plane to on-premises to other clouds. It also can bring Azure services. So if I have something like Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes, well, once I have that Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes, I can then deploy certain data services, certain AI services, certain app services. And on the data service side, one of those is SQL managed instance. So now I get this evergreen managed patched SQL instance on that Arc enabled Kubernetes. One of the things they added in SQL Server 22 was object storage with the S3 protocol. So commonly used for AWS, but others as well. That might be useful in data lake virtualization. Hey, I want to use Polybase to go and access files in the data lake and then query it via T-SQL but I could also do things like backup. So now for the Azure Arc enabled SQL MI, I can backup and restore to an S3 destination. Uh, my SQL Flexible, Flexible member is based on virtual machines, so I can stop start, use burstable, have highly available configurations, have more control of the little switches and attributes for the configuration of the database, now has server logs. So I can go in and turn on selected logs and it will keep that for me. I think the maximum amount of data it will keep is seven gigabytes. That's free and a 24 hour 
um, cyclical, so it will delete things older than 24 hours, and I can just then go and download the file. So I can then go and grab the file from the portal or other interfaces, view the data, maybe it helps me troubleshoot, but that's now GA. PostgreSQL Hyperscale now has new versions. So the Hyperscale is built on the Citus extension to give me distributed tables to shard my data over many instances, gives me great scale, uh, gives me great performance, capacity. The new minor versions are just of the Postgres, 11.17, 12.12, 13.8, and 14.5. And then Azure SQL Managed Instance, running in Azure, has Windows Authentication with Azure AD Kerberos. So I've talked about this before, I've done a video on Azure AD native Kerberos. So Azure AD can now actually provide Kerberos authentication, it can create the tokens for identities that were synchronized from an Active Directory, and then services can use that. I did a demo around using SMB, but now Azure SQL MI can use Windows authentication and use the Azure AD Kerberos service to actually perform that Kerberos-based authentication. So that feature is now available as well. On the miscellaneous side, so the new central Qatar region has gone GA. Now what's interesting about this region, it does not have a paired region. It has three availability zones. And so services that require a paired region would not show in this region. So for example, if I quickly went and looked at this region, let's go over here for a second. If I was, for example, gonna create a storage account and I picked the new region, so it should show, there you go, star central, I will not see a GRS because GRS requires, hey, I'm gonna synchronize to the paired region. So you're, you're not gonna see that. But the key point is more and more services now really give you the flexibility. If you look at nearly all the database offerings, you pick where do I want an async replica. Cosmos DB, where do I want the replicas? When I think of VM replication, you pick where you want that replication to using ASR. So for most things now, even blob storage, I can do the object level replication. I can pick a storage account in any region where I want. So there's more and more shift away to giving you that flexibility. But hey, this new region's available, but be aware it doesn't have a natural paired region because it's the only region in that geopolitical boundary. And so you will see certain services that rely on that pairing uh, would not be there. Microsoft DevBox went in preview. So this is built on Windows 365, but it gives you this high performance pre-configured developer environment. I can manage them with things like Intune, Microsoft Endpoint Manager for my infrastructure team. And what typically you're gonna do is you'll create a pool of these. So if I was, for example, just super, super quickly, if I looked at, for example, projects, I can create projects of, um, based on these dev center solutions I've set up. So I create certain projects. And then once I create these projects, you'll also see it's like dev box, and there's not the dev box instances, but as just a regular developer, I could actually just go straight to devbox.microsoft.com. And so if they have gone and created the pool, so my team have created a pool, and then they've given me a certain role, which I have not done, but assuming I have this dev center dev box user as one of my or attributes for this, that are back control of a certain project that I've created, I would be able to go and self-serve and spin one of these things up. So DevBox is now, it's been talked about for a while, but now it's in preview, you can actually go and, and play around with that. Azure Monitor Logs Data Export, Export Rules, not Xbox, Export Rules now have support for App Insights. So the whole point, remember, with Azure Monitor Logs, we get all this data ingested in it, stored in, in tables based on the source of that data. What a data export rule lets me do is on a continual basis, basically real time, as data is written to the table I specify in the export rule, it can be sent somewhere else, an event hub, a storage account. But there's no filtering, it's everything to that table, 
hey, it goes to that target I set up in the export rule. So what they've done is in the list of tables that supported for this, they've now added support for the app insights tables. So if you go and actually look at all of the tables that are supported, you'll see a whole bunch of kind of app ones. But hey, you can see things like the app availability results, um, browser timings, and there should be things like dependencies. And you'll see a whole bunch of events, exceptions, metrics, page views, performance counters, requests, traces, system events. So a whole bunch now, if I want to then take them from my Log Analytics workspace and continuously export them to an event hub, which would be good to another SIM, could then subscribe and take, or just a storage account. Hey, I can now do that. But again, there's no filtering, it's everything. If I wanted to filter, hey, I could write something like an Azure function that goes and looks and periodically uh, goes and sends those logs out. Azure Monitor also now has some of its additional capabilities available in new regions. So US Virginia Gov, US Arizona Gov, China East 3 and China North 3. So thinking more about those sovereign clouds. So Azure Monitor Logs recently introduced things like basic logs, archive logs, and with archive logs, gives me the ability to search. So particular results can be sent to a table or just restore um, to a restore table. Basic, it's cheaper to ingest. I have limited sets of KQL I can run against it, only keeps it for eight days in the basic logs. Archives I can keep for much, much longer. Um, I pay a lot less money, but I have to bring it back through a restore or a search to actually then do something with the data. All those features are now available in those new regions I mentioned. And then Container Insights has got an agent rename. There's a whole, I guess, push from the old OMS name to new Azure Monitor agent. This doesn't really change any functionality, but if I had maybe certain rules or checks where it's looking for OMS agent, be aware it's changing to Azure Monitor agent. If I had certain queries, or hey, I'm gonna not just look for OMS agent, I'll be looking at uh, AMA logs, for example. There's a whole blog that goes through the detail, but just be aware there is an agent rename coming for Container Insights. And also when I think of Container Insights, part of the shift to the Azure Monitor agent is the ability to use a managed identity for authentication instead of the old style certificate local based authentication. So now if I want to, with Container Insights, I can switch to using um, that managed identity for the authentication. It can be for my Linux based, it's Linux based only, for my AKS or my ARC enabled. Kubernetes uh, clusters. And that was it. So I hope that was useful. And until the next video, take care.